Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette, the place where millions of men come each month to learn more about classic men's style. In today's video, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. Yes, I love classic men's style, especially historic clothes, and today I'm going to take a closer look at the outfits and suits in the original Godfather from 1972. I'll try to point out things that are off, note certain details, and what we could have maybe improved. <laughs> Pasta cannolis, tommy guns and striped suits today are often associated with the gangster genre and they owe this legacy in a great part to the original Godfather movie from 1972. The costume designer was Anna Hill Johnstone and she tried to emulate a 1940s aesthetic. Of course though, with them being in the 70s, usually these movies all have a certain hint of the era they were filmed in, just like for example The Great Gatsby does. So first up, let's take a look at the godfather himself, Don Vito Corleone. As you know, the movie starts out in his office at his daughter's wedding day, with him wearing a black tuxedo. I mean, if you look at him, looks like a stiff shirt. You can see there's some X pleats there, which means it was a stiff shirt front, a Marcella bib front, not a pleated shirt front. His bow tie hangs there slightly crooked. And if we take a closer look, it's actually a pre-tied bow tie. You can also see a big red boutonniere pinned on his lapel, not worn through the buttonhole. In the 40s, especially mid 45, 1945 after the war when this movie was set, men would have worn a boutonniere through the buttonhole, not pinned onto it. You can see he has two visible shirt studs, which is accurate at the time. Today, shirts oftentimes have three visible studs. In the beginning, they look black, but upon further notice, they almost seem like a gray glass that becomes lighter with a reflection at times. There's even a photo where it almost looks white, but in the movie, he wore something that was probably a darkish gray. And it's actually, you can also really see this kind of V-cut of the vest, and that shows you that it's a proper evening vest, not something that you often see today, but in the 40s, you would definitely have worn a tuxedo with a cummerbund, or more commonly with a vest, so that, that's correct. You can definitely see that it's a bib shirt front when he takes off his jacket. I mean, now just look at his bow tie. It's like dangling there, and it's very symmetrical, and the tips are exactly on point, it's very flat, and it's a sure sign that in the movie they used a pre-tied bow tie. Now, back in the 40s, men would have tied their own bow tie, so that's definitely not accurate. Now, here in this one scene, when he slowly turns around, you can see there's an adjuster on the left side because it's a wing collar, and that is something that in 1945, he probably would not have worn because he would have worn a fixed, proper black bow tie, which is the right way to do it, the classic way to do it, and uh, that's the only style we sell at the Gentleman's Gazette shop. Interestingly, you can see here that he's wearing a white tie shirt with a detachable stiff collar. In one picture, you could see the collar stud reflecting from underneath. So back in the day, men would have shirts where the collar was not sewn on. And this wing collar was typical for a white tie shirt, for example, but it would also have been worn more in the 20s and 30s with suits. Later on, collars became attached. They became softer. They weren't starched as much. But um, what he's wearing in terms of a shirt would be kind of a mix because for black tie, you'd have a softer collar shirt that was turned on collar, a trend the Prince of Wales, later um, Duke of Windsor introduced, but he was old school in the 1940s and so he would wear this more stiff collared formal shirt. You can also see that it's not a typical double cuffed shirt that you would get today. If you look at the cuffs, they're rounded and they're single cuffs, they're not folded over. Now there's one thing you can actually see his cufflinks a little bit and you can see that they probably match the shirt studs. Of course, in the 70s, they didn't have 4K or HD TV, so it's hard to see the details. Now, it was very common to have a dress set that had coordinated shirt studs as well as cufflinks. Here you can see them wearing a swivel T-bar cufflink, which was a little more pedestrian and typically for evening sets, you had two-sided sets, such as from Kremens, for example, or other places that had these double-sided dress sets. It's hard to see, but actually the back of the collar is piped 
with silk satin, typically in a tuxedo, the lapel is faced in satin or in grosgrain to make it different from a regular suit and to be a little more shiny and sparkle the light. So the piping that he has is typically something you would have seen earlier in the 20s or in the 30s for formal morning wear, not for formal evening wear. That didn't take place until the late 60s or 70s, and I remember that Maurice Sandwell from Andrew Rambrook, he had this kind of a piping that looked kind of funny um, on a tuxedo, but this is definitely an influence from the 70s in this costume here. Now let's look at his lapel. You can see little ripples, which is common in silk lapels, so that's normal. And while his lapels are quite wide, they're probably on the wider side of the 1940s lapel. And he also has a notch lapel, which at the time was not very popular, especially not for tuxedos, because classically they have a peak lapel and you can learn all about black tie and the classics in our in-depth black tie guide here. Yes, you can find notch lapel tuxedos, and you could probably even find them rarely in the 40s, but they were usually associated with a rental tuxedo or kind of a lower class tuxedo, not something the top of the food chain mobster boss would have worn. This one scene, we get a close look at his waistcoat. It has three black buttons. And actually, if you take a closer look here, you can see that the shirt bib doesn't reach all the way down to the vest. So you can see that the length of the vest is a little too short for the shirt, but if it was shorter, the pants have a low rise, and so the shirt peeks out from underneath the vest. So a Italian mobster of this caliber would have certainly had his suit tailored, and this outfit was not tailored for Marlon Brando, I can tell you that. There's only one scene where you can see the shoes. It seems to me like it's a pair of black leather derby shoes. Um, it's really hard to tell. And that is a style that maybe in Austria is correct to be worn, but in the US, you would typically wear either opera pumps with a bow in patent leather or regular calf leather, or you'd have plain toe Oxfords. And uh, this is again, not correct. So overall, how does the Godfather himself stack up? There's a number of issues, the adjustable pre-tied bow tie, the boutonniere, the cufflinks, and the little details that are off. But compared to other people in the film, just look at this guy here, for example, with his socks that are too short and the um, pants actually coming out on top of the vest, he's doing much better. Also, he's not as bad as Johnny, for example, who wears a ruffle shirt, which was popular in the late 60s and 70s, but not at all in the 40s. So they clearly took something from the modern day era and put it in the movie. I don't know if it was product placement or it was just an, an oversight. I, I can see they wanted to make the character more flamboyant, but it was just wrong and no one would have worn that in 1945. Okay, next up we see Vito's brownish, grayish, um, bold striped suit. It's a very interesting outfit because he wears it for a business outfit. The shirt is kind of in a palish olive green and his tie has kind of a micro pattern that is 60s inspired kind of Macclesfield pattern, um, which you would typically see in a matter silk. Here it's kind of harder to tell what it is exactly. There are tones of blue and red, maybe even a little brown. Lapels seem to be at three and a half inches wide, which is something that you could have worn in the 40s. Later on in the 70s, they became wider. So this is pretty much on point. In this one scene here, you can see that it has a single vent, which again, suits at a time, probably would have had no vent. And a single vent came from horseback riding. Um, more in the 60s and 70s, you definitely had more center vents. You can also see he doesn't have a pocket square and uh, kind of a missed opportunity in that sense. But again, not all men wore pocket squares back then. In terms of sleeve length, he likes to wear his sleeves longer. He did it with a tuxedo where you couldn't see the shirt and here too, you can't see any shirt cuff. I mean, interestingly, you can see all the others wearing traditional business suits with like white shirts, but he's wearing this very casual ensemble, just showing I'm the man. I don't have to adapt to conventional dress codes. I can wear whatever I want when I conduct business. 
He obviously favors those earth tones, which are different than what usually people would wear around him. And it's just another nod to the way the film uses color to define characters or make implications. For example, whenever you see orange, something bad is gonna happen. Now his preference for earth tones is continued into the next scene when uh, there is an assassination attempt. He has his overcoat and this kind of low wet color and they're in the street and you see the orange fire burning. There are uh, oranges on the shelves that he's gonna buy and then uh, shit hits the fan and he takes five bullets basically. You can just see how he goes down. He has this bolt multi strap tie. Definitely think it's something I would have worn. Also, the shirt color is not like a plain white. It's maybe like a pale orange or pastel shirt, which is definitely something you would have seen more often in the 40s. They've fallen a bit out of favor. If you look at the hat, it's a silver belly colored fedora, right? All in that kind of earthy tonal range that is more subdued and less contrasty than like a, a black or navy or charcoal suit. Actually, as he gets shot and falls down and turns towards the front so we can see him, you can actually see his belt buckle and there's a little C on it for Corleone. Later on, when Vito's recovered and they're at the table with all the other mobsters trying to keep the peace. You can actually see him deviating from that color scheme. Now he wears this dark three-piece suit and he has a collar that's um, very classic, very long. Today you'd see a much more spread collar. Now in the 70s also you had these big, bold, oversized collars and I think this would be okay for the 1940s with the exception of the tie space. This collar has a lot of tie space, which is something you saw later on in the decades. In the 40s, you simply saw less tie space. The tie is kind of a brown, red, and blue paisley tie, which uh, stands out a little bit, but again, it's hard to tell. He also wears a pocket square in a kind of a crown fold to just, um, underline the somber importance of the event. If you take a closer look, you can also see that it's a double-breasted suit that has a vest underneath of it, which for 1945 is something you still could have seen because central heating was just starting to really become mainstream and up until then places have only been cold. So I think that extra layer underneath the double, double-breasted double layers kept you extra warm. Since he was an older guy, it's realistic that he could have worn that kind of style, but today you're definitely not gonna see that unless you go custom. Also during World War II, there was a fabric shortage, so double-breasted suits in general fell out of favor because they used up more fabric than single-breasted suits. Now you could argue Vito wearing this kind of a suit just shows him that he's from the older guard, or maybe that he's disregarding the needs of the common man or society in general. Later in the movie, you can see Vito wearing a much more casual outfit. It consists of this shirt that is grayish with an orangey overcheck, which is unusual, with slightly contrasting gray wool pants. There are tones of olive green, muted blues, and orange in his shirt. If you look at his collar, it uh, doesn't have collar stays, but he buttons it up all the way, uh, which is kind of a funny look. It's not a really 1940s thing but uh, it's, it's odd. But it also has a, a pocket and you can see it's not neatly ironed. It's just a shirt for comfort. Later on, you can also see him wearing a dark gray cardigan as a form of outerwear. If you take a closer look at the shoulder seam of the shirt, you can see that the seam is outside of his actual shoulder, so it's cut a little too big. I don't know if it was intentional or just an oversight. Now that he's not in the helmet of the family anymore, he spends more time in his garden playing with his grandson, which is also where we see him in his last scene. He has the same kind of gray trousers that he wears again, right? Because he doesn't have to change so much. His shirt looks kind of whitish or off-white. It's sometimes hard to tell in the sun. The shirt is definitely cut looser, which was much more typical at the time because shirts typically weren't worn on their own. So they were really there for comfort and to protect your outer clothes. So they were cut really roomy and not slim fit at all. So that's pretty accurate of a shirt that someone would have worn at the time. 
He also still wears his hat outside because that's what men did. They wore hats, especially the ones of the old guard. So next up, let's look at the outfits of Vito's youngest son, Michael. He's first introduced coming to his sister's wedding after the war, wearing his kind of greenish brown military uniform and dragging along his girlfriend Kay, who is not Italian. The uniform is a standard olive green jacket and the shirt has a tan color that you would have seen in US uniforms at the time. When he's introduced, he doesn't want to have anything to do with a family business and he's aspiring to do his own thing that is a little more socially acceptable. There are epaulets on the shoulder, but then a half belted back and a center vent. Nevertheless, though, if you take a closer look, you can see the stereotypical Italian bracelet. Later on, you see glimpses of his outfits, but they're not really full outfits. So the next full one comes quite a bit later when they discuss the assassination attempts. And you can see him wearing a kind of a brown corduroy jacket. He has this kind of button down collared shirt with a fine white and maybe grayish stripe. It's a tie that has an um, orange, brown and white in it with kind of a bolder stripe. It's definitely a pattern that would have been popular maybe more in the 50s, I'd say. So it's probably pretty accurate. He's wearing a wristwatch with a leather band. He's wearing dark socks and uh, gray pants. They seem to be flannel but it's hard to tell. And actually the shoes upon close inspection, they are Blauchers, named after the German General von Blücher. And uh, they're like a, a Derby variation. And to learn more about that, check out this scat on our website here. Oh yeah, now there's zoom in. You can see the corduroy, which is brown. And um, at the time it's a very classic fabric. It's actually uh, made in the same way as a velvet, just with cut in ridges. You can see this jacket here in that close view has a machine stitched hem, which is something that became more popular in the late 50s, sometimes also earlier 50s. Higher end um, handmade suits typically would have hand picked stitching and not this strong machine stitching. You would also see that later on in the 70s. So maybe that's what they chose there. Now, in general, having a button down collar with a tie uh, can be a hotly discussed topic. And to learn more about whether you can wear it together or not, we answer that question on our website too. In other scenes, you can also see him at the same outfit with kind of a brown single breasted overcoat and uh, very kind of classic, clean, somber look. But again, utilizing these earth tones, no stark contrasts of white shirts. Yeah, when he tries to get his father out of the hospital, you could even argue that he has this kind of Ivy League or trad style look. Um, after all, he attended college and he looks a little more educated than his brothers because of that. And when I say educated, I mean, he just looks more like someone at an Ivy League school would have looked than the brothers do. The brothers are more flamboyant. They're noticeably different compared to Michael. And again, you can see maybe there's an orange in his tie and that's a hint that his innocence will soon, uh, yeah, be over. And no, I'm not the only one making up this Ivy League term. There's this one scene where Sonny refers to Vito's Optrons and Jack combination as an Ivy League suit. You gotta get up close like this, but a bing, you blow their brains all over your nice Ivy League suit. And obviously, as you know, suit comes from the French word suivre, which means to follow. And it's referred to a jacket and pants out of a matching fabric. So a combination can never be a suit. That's what I'd reference Ivy League um, kind of comes into play here. Now, if you look at Michael's next outfit here, he actually wears this kind of gray three piece flannel suit with a button down collar shirt again that he wears with a tie striped. It looks like a white and maybe a gray. It could also be a, a kind of washed out dark blue. Hard to tell exactly in the picture. You could argue that the typical business colors of red and gray, which we made a video about, are a very kind of common business color combination. And he wears that here to indicate he's um, serious about business. Of course, uh, he has different plans and doesn't intend to honor anything that's agreed on and, and walks out killing cop and uh, the guy who tried to assassinate his father. 
Take a closer look there, you'll see some collar gap, which is generally something Hollywood has issues with a lot of times. That fit is not 100%, and it's just surprising because in British productions oftentimes, they just get that right every time. Now, once Michael heads off to Sicily, you can see him wearing this kind of striped vest, which is too short for him, walking around with his bodyguards and a flat cap, and you can learn more about flat caps over here. The next kind of major outfit again is then him wearing his like black wedding suit. It's a black double-breasted wedding suit that he wears instead of a morning coat. Now in, in Sicily at the time, you know, maybe morning coats weren't the style anymore, but you still had that boutonniere and this time it's worn through the buttonhole, not pinned onto it. It's a big white carnation and interestingly wears a Winchester shirt, which means it's a white collar with a different colored body. Even though the carnation is so big, you can see him with a little bit of a pocket square and sometimes it actually blends together. But if you look closely, there's actually a pocket square and a carnation. He also has black shoes, which is fairly typical. Now, in general, black suits are overrated. We'll explain why in this video here. Now, last but not least, one interesting outfit worn by Michael is his double-breasted gray suit. It has this kind of faint stripe. He has this kind of light blue or off-white shirt with kind of a black and white striped silk tie. He's wearing it with a Homburg hat and uh, it's actually was somewhat of a renaissance for the Hamburg hat because it has this brimmed curl. It's an older hat and the history goes back to Bad Homburg, a town in Germany where the then Prince of Wales would often come for vacation and he picked up that hat and, and made it popular. As you imagined in the 70s, hats had already fallen out of favor, but this movie for a short while actually managed to uh, make him more popular again, especially the Hamburg, which is what well, was also known as the Godfather hat. I mean, even Run DMC adopted that Hamburg hat and it had mainly to do with this movie, I'd say. If you notice one thing, he rarely actually wears a pocket square, even in the last scene. Maybe it's because he just doesn't care about it. I think in the 30s, you would have seen men with pocket squares across the board. Here he only wore it for his wedding day. And I think that maybe it's just part of a um, style in the 70s. Pocket squares weren't really popular anymore. But maybe it's just a signal that they're mafia and they can do whatever they want. Next up, let's look at the oldest son of the Colleone family, Sonny. And uh, you can see him wearing a tuxedo, especially a double-breasted tuxedo with peak lapels, and it's not a 4X1, which would mean you had four buttons and one closing buttons, but it's a 6-2, meaning six buttons with two closing buttons. Considering this is right after the war, and during the war, single-breasted jackets were the number one thing, you can see that he likes to be flashy and more flamboyant. You could have certainly seen those, and you can see it's definitely wider cut, which in the mid 40s, you know, some of the tuxedos could have been still from like the 30s. Because if it was a 40s suit, they would have been a little trimmer in the pants. You can see there's still quite a bit of shoulder padding. There's no vents in the back, which was very common and typical. Same if you look at the tuxedo of his father, that was also ventless, and you can pretty much only see that in this dancing scene with his daughter here. That was the proper way to do it because the idea of no vents in the back meant that you get a clean silhouette. You can see that he has no pocket square, but he actually wears the same white high shirt with a stiff um, double cuffs that are not folded, so they're not traditional um, double cuffs, but it's a white high shirt with a double-breasted tuxedo it's kind of a more unusual look, but I don't know if they would have actually done it like that in the 40s. You can also see he has this pinky ring and he has the T-bar cufflinks, which again, they would have been more double-sided cufflinks. I mean, through the movie, Sonny is kind of the impulsive one, kind of a hitman of the family. Again, he's also wearing an adjustable bow tie that is pre-tied. Again, not something you, you would have seen, just doesn't look great. 
So in this next scene here, you see him beating up his sister's husband because he abused her. And he's just, you know, you can see his tie is not really tied. And he's wearing this kind of gray black suit. The vest isn't really done. But he still has black and white spectator shoes that just yell like, look at me. Overall, his impulsive nature, right, is, is his portrait through his clothes. He's just never really put together. It's not thought through. It's just uh, whatever, you know, comes to mind in any given situation. So was it accurate for a 1940s? It's hard to imagine for me that someone would have been so open because, again, it was not common that you just showed your shirt in public on the street, right? It must have been pretty different, but maybe he just didn't give a shit about dress codes at the time. Now, in his final scene here, he has another unfinished outfit. It's kind of a gray double-breasted suit that he's wearing without a tie, has kind of a blue overcheck, and a shirt is light blue too, which is fine, but typically and traditionally, at that time, a double-breasted suit was a little more formal than a single-breasted one because it had the peak lapels, had more of that military influence. So not wearing with a tie would not have been something a typical 1940s man would have done. Obviously, after he's Tommy Gun, the suit is hardly recognizable. But overall, he's not someone to look up to for genuine 40s style or classic men style in general. Next up, let's look at another brother, Fredo Corleone. In this short opening scene, you can just seeing him saying hi to Kay, talking to Michael, and it's very obvious that he has this adjustable bow tie, a pre-tied. Seems like they all had it. He has that big carnation. And for him, if you take a closer look here, you can actually see that he does neither have a cummerbund nor a vest. So you see the end of the bib and the shirt underneath just bunching up. Definitely not something that a person in his position would have worn like that. I think it was an oversight of the costume designers here. I just thought it didn't matter or what, but uh, not very historically accurate. Otherwise, you know, he's wearing the same kind of stiff shirt with the T-bar cufflinks here too. You don't see much in the movie once quickly when the dad's assassinated. It's just more obvious that he can't kind of get his gun out quickly enough. He has more of a softer side, some may call it effeminate even. If we look at him here later, he's sent to Vegas and he's kind of welcoming Michael. He has this kind of creamish off-white or even yellow sport coat that he combines with a black shirt with like a disco collar. And no, it's not just like a a classic collar from the 40s. And, and I get it, right? Vegas was always out there. And, and uh, he also had this bandana, which was dark with a, a pattern on it. In contrast, you see Michael, for example, with a somber, dark business suit, the kind of reddish tie. And he tells him to get rid of all the women in the room and, and, and come to business. And he's wearing his kind of aviatorish sunglasses with a disco style. Definitely flamboyant and more like of an Elvis impersonation in my mind. And as you can see, like Michael doesn't take him seriously because of that. So they use the clothes to underline the characters, their moods, and what they want to communicate here. Yeah, look at that. I mean, definitely the classic point collar in from the 40s and 50s was shorter than this disco collar. Uh, he has a brown belt and like a checked pair of pants that you can see here in the background. Definitely something that's louder. He's also wearing a ring on his ring finger. There's kind of this obvious rift between Michael and Fredo, and I think that'll carry over into The Godfather too. I know it was you, Fredo. A more interesting style approach from a classic point of view is definitely Tom Hagen, the consigliere and then later the lawyer of the family. When he's first sent to LA to speak with Waltz to give Johnny that role that he desires, he wears this typical kind of lawyerish gray suit. You can see him strolling down the street. It's like a gray fedora hat, gray suit, white shirt, navy tie. 
The suit is double-breasted and upon close inspection, you can see nice peak lapels. It's kind of an interesting fabric. It almost looks like a herringbone kind of stripe, but it has an element of, of pinpoints in it as well. You can take a closer look at it at the dinner when he sits at a dinner table, listening to um, what's going on. They're just having dinner. His counterpart wears this kind of blue blazer with white piping. Early on, you could see him like this tennis sweater when they were in a horse stable. So Tom, on the other hand, is just very sober. Also, his whole mannerisms are all very matter-of-factly, very rational, just as you would expect it from a lawyer. Even though his suit is double-breasted, he doesn't wear cufflinks with it, which is something back in the day, because the double was more formal, people would have worn shirts with cufflinks with it. Also, especially the scene you can see, there's a terrible collar gap going on, and they didn't really pay attention to that, which is kind of sad, because I think it would have looked even better and would have made him look more proper, like a lawyer who got his bespoke suits. You can see there, there's some shoulder padding, but it's not super strong. So it's, it's realistic with what you have worn at that time in terms of padding and silhouette. I still think the collar gap is just too much. No tailor would have let you out the door looking like that. Throughout the film, he always dresses like that picture lawyer, you know, white shirts, dark suits, kind of patterned silk tie. The most disheveled you can see him is where he has taken his jacket off. But still then, you know, he looks so much better than Sonny does, for example. So how accurate are the Godfather's costumes overall? Well, I think they want to get that classic feel of the 1940s, but there's definitely some 60s and 70s influences. And it's overall not 100% historically accurate. But no American movie I've ever seen is or was. The British, on the other hand, are just miles ahead in that department. And sometimes the outfits are a bit oversized. If you look at the suits of the B cast or the C cast, you can sometimes see really wide lapels and low gorges, which is not something you would have seen like that in the 1940s. So part of the 70s uh, modern trends made its way into that movie here. Also, some of the ties in the movie are worn quite a bit longer than they would have been worn in the 1940s. By the late 60s in the US, Ralph Lauren had these super wide ties, but if you go back in time, ties were a lot shorter than they are today, and they were oftentimes they ended at the belly button, which in combination they were designed for high-waisted trousers. So they got for it. They tried to use the more high-waisted pants, but with the longer ties, so it doesn't quite mix as well. My outfit today was not something that you saw exactly in The Godfather, but it was inspired by it. It consists of this kind of dark gray flannel suit, double-breasted. I'm pairing it with this long point collar shirt with quite a bit of tie space and uh, with a vintage looking tie from that era, which is in silk. It's also not a bold contrasting white shirt, but it contains green and blue tones, which is why my pocket square is also in green linen, so it's kind of a more lower contrast than if you had a white pocket square, for example. I also skipped the cufflinks, went with a shirt with barrel cuffs. I went with black Oxfords in a very 1940s-ish style. No chisel toe, nothing fancy. And then just some gray over-the-calf socks with some clocks from Fort Belvedere. Of course, last but not least, I got a little pinky ring here in black, and I would wear it outside with a Hamburg hat and a nod to Michael's last suit outfit. <laughs>